This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. It's 2024. As we move into this election year, we look now at how the powerful lobby group, AIPAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, is set to spend more than $100 million against progressive Congress members critical of Israeli human rights violations in Palestine. The goal is to remove members of the squad from Congress this year, including Congress members Cory Bush, Ilhan Omar, Jamal Bowman, Summer Lee, and the only Palestinian American member of Congress, Rashida Tlaib. This comes as a Data for Progress poll found two thirds of U.S. voters support a ceasefire in Gaza, including 80 percent of Democrats. For more, we're joined by Ryan Grimm. D.C. bureau chief of The Intercept. His book is just out. It's titled The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Revolution. Ryan, why don't you lay out your revelations in this book? Um, and perhaps you can start with AOC and what happened um, when she was elected. I want to play for you a clip. You write in your book about how a representative of APAC approached Democratic Congress member Alexandra Casio Cortez's team with an offer of a hundred thousand dollars in July of 2018 to quote start the conversation about her views on Israel. This is the then candidate Ocasio Cortez being interviewed on PBS in 2018 before she was reportedly contacted by AIPAC. You, in the campaign, made one tweet or made one statement mm -hmm. that referred to um, a a killing by Israeli soldiers of civilians in Gaza mm -hmm. and called it a massacre, which mm -hmm. became a little bit controversial. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen anywhere. Uh, what is your position on Israel? Well, I believe absolutely in Israel's right to exist. I, I am a proponent of a two-state solution. Um, and for me, it's not, it's, this is not a referendum, I think, on the state of Israel. For me, the lens through which I saw this incident as an activist, as an organizer, if 60 people were killed in Ferguson, Missouri, if 60 people were killed in the South Bronx, unarmed, 60 people were killed in, in Puerto Rico, I just looked at that incident more through, uh, through just as an incident. And to me, it would just be completely unacceptable if that happened on our shores. So that was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in 2018, before she was first elected and um, one of the four members of what's known as the Squad, which is also the title of your book, Ryan Grimm. Can you take it from there, what you reveal in this book? Yeah, so, and later in that uh, interview, the interviewer, uh, Hoover, uh, really starts to parse a lot of her words. You know, you said the word occupation. You know, you said the word Palestine. What do you mean by this? And you can see her growing even more kind of visibly kind of uncomfortable about where the conversation is heading. And she finally just taps out at the end and says, look, I'm not a geopolitical expert on this issue. This wasn't something that we talked about at my dinner table, you know, in among Puerto Rican families uh, in the in the Bronx. And she just moves on from there and, and actually stops doing interviews uh, for a little while after that, he, a, after she'd been kind of from the time of her, her win in June until then, just kind of dominating and, and getting, you know, bigger and bigger interview requests, uh, you know, eventually even doing like late night shows. So then, like you said, a week later, her team gets a call uh, from somebody who says they're, they're with APAC and that they saw the interview and that they're willing to help, uh, you know, educate her on the issue, start the conversation. And to start that conversation, they've already gotten commitments of you know, up to $100,000, and there would be a lot more money where that came from. Now, she didn't even consider the offer. She had plenty of uh, campaign cash coming in. It wasn't even about the campaign cash, but it did open a window for her team and for her about what Congress is like for so many rank-and-file members of Congress who didn't have her profile at that point. Because now, not only are you being offered $100,000 just to start, and there's a lot more where that came from, it comes with an implicit threat, and I think that's what you want to get into later. If you don't take the money, that money will still be spent, but it will be spent against you instead. 
And Ryan, could you talk about, uh, and you do so in the book, APAC's role in uh, in purging the Democratic Party of any uh, of any uh, potential uh, uh, candidates or office holders who uh, who don't toe the line when it comes to uh, Israel? So the same month uh, that the squad was sworn into office, and that included Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, is January 2019. Uh, the, the, the super PAC Democratic Majority for Israel was stood up with this splashy New York Times profile. It, it was kind of, it was affiliated with APAC. It was founded by uh, Mark Melman, uh, who is an APAC advisor who had led APAC's effort to undo uh, Barack Obama's Iran deal. He's also, or he was at the time, a consultant to Yair Lapid, who, as you know, is the uh, head of the Yesh Atid party, eventually he actually became, while uh, he was Melman's client, prime minister of Israel. So he was wearing multiple hats. So he founds this super PAC, DMFI, which then kind of does APAC's work in the 2020 and 2020, uh, in the 2020 cycle. And they're built basically explicitly to, to stop the expansion of this faction within the Democratic Party that feels willing uh, to criticize Israel. Uh, in, in May 2021, the last time there was a major war on Gaza, the squad and a number of other House Democrats you know, went to the House floor uh, denouncing Israel's attack on Gaza. And that was sort of an alarm bell uh, for AIPAC. And so AIPAC itself then, uh, after that, launched its own super PAC after DMFI had spent you know, millions itself. And in that cycle, the 2021-22 cycle, spent more than $30 million. Now they're looking to spend you know, significantly more this cycle. And you also say that the rise of the squad and the rise of the counter-revolutionary forces has been simultaneous. Could you elaborate on that? Because obviously Donald Trump never tires of criticizing the squad as if they are in charge of the Democratic Party. Yeah, it was really remarkable to, to go back and kind of re-report this story, the arc of kind of the, starting with, the, say, the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2015, 16, up, up through today to see just how central this question of Israel-Palestine has been, you know, to the kind of pushback and the reaction to the rise of the squad the entire time. You know, the Democrats in, in 2018, if you remember, they ran against, uh, they ran against Trump, uh, they ran against his wall, his xenophobia, his Muslim ban, and much of the first six months of the Democratic majority in 2019 was spent with Democrats, sometimes joined by Trump, sometimes not, coming after Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, you know, for, for various transgressions in tweets or uh, speeches or otherwise. And it, it, it really kind of, you know, dictated and determined what the entire kind of progressive wing was doing. And so oftentimes you'll have the organization Justice Democrats or members of the squad say, you know, why are you spending so much time focusing on Israel-Palestine? And the answer would be, they're not. It's actually, it's actually the reaction. They're kind of, they're kind of forced to. And so that, the amount of spending that was done against them and that continues to be done against them kind of forged them into a, a cohesive political formation that might not actually have existed otherwise. But so in the 2022 cycle, like you said, you know, that's when they spent you know, millions against not just Nina Turner, the most high profile example that they kept out, out of Congress, uh, but also across the country. Uh, going after uh, progressives who were critical of Israel, but also were progressive because, you know, the, the same kind of uh, hedge fund, private equity executives, uh, you know, baseball team owners that are funding APAC and DMFI also have the same kind of interests as the uh, as any you know, major business owner uh, would. So the, the same agenda that is, uh, you know, that is that that forms kind of the squad's criticism of Israel also, you know, there's their support of uh, Green New Deal, Medicare for all, you know, higher, you know, closing, you know, tax loopholes for the wealthy. So it's kind of a, a, a bonus that you, that you kind of can align your class interests with this uh, fight against, uh, you know, Palest Palestinian rights. So if you can talk more, Ryan Grimm, about this election year, about the hundred million dollars, who's involved with that, about the targeting of the squad, the squad plus, you know, more people who are allied with the squad have been elected since then, and also the role of Mark Penn and Burson Marsteller. 
Right. So tw 2022 was the first time in its history that APAC did its own super PAC. Previously, uh, it, it had you know, given directly to campaigns or its members had given directly to campaigns and uh, DMFI had done a super PAC kind of affiliated with, with APAC, but not straight from them. 2022 was the first time they did that. And they came through, like, well, like I said, more than more than $30 million in some races, you know, spending more than $5 million. Uh, they, they spent millions against Summer Lee uh, in, in the Pittsburgh race in the, in the last you know, a month of the campaign. Uh, but there was enough kind of pushback from a, an organized group of progressive super PACs and also small donors that she was able to just barely <clears throat> that she was able to just barely hang on. And so in 2022, they really tried to kind of constrain the, the growth of the of the squad and, and squad aligned factions within the party. To th this cycle, they're really trying to shrink them. Like you said, they there's been reporting uh, that, you know, there, there have been offers of you know, 20 million dollars to two different candidates to try to run against Rashida Tlaib. They've successfully recruited candidates to run against uh, Jamal Bowman. Uh, Corey Bush uh, ha has a challenge. Ilhan Omar as a challenge. So now they're coming kind of directly at them. Uh, now, Mark, Mark Penn and Nancy Jacobson are also kind of main characters uh, in this book as well, as along with along with Mark Penn's protege, Josh Gottheimer, who's a congressman from North Jersey, who's sort of like the chief antagonist of the squad. Uh, and they have uh, they have raised you know tens of millions of dollars over the years for this organization. Uh, no labels, also from hedge fund executives, you know, pr private equity folks, you know, football team owners that uh, you know, Home Depot uh, CEOs, that 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 kind of crowd, uh, they 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 spend, they try to you know uh, present themselves as this kind of non-aligned uh, centrist organization. Nancy Jacobson has said you know APAC is one of her, uh, in one of the organizations that she works most closely with, and of course, famously now they're trying to recruit a a Joe Manchin type figure to run as a as a quote unquote kind of independent. Uh, in the presidential campaign, which presumably would uh, be to the benefit of Trump. Uh, you mentioned Josh Gottheimer, could, uh, the congressman from New Jersey. Could you talk about his history before he got into Congress? Yeah. It's, it's, it is an interesting history, because not only does it have this kind of standard kind of pro-Israel uh, activism, uh, but he, he worked with, you know, with, Mark, with Mark Penn uh, for many years, uh, and Mark Penn did a lot of his business with uh, with Saudi Arabia, and that gets to kind of a a, a creation of a political uh, uh, alliance in Washington that didn't get a lot of publicity over the years, which is kind of the the, the teaming up of the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. Those two countries still don't even you know recognize Israel, but in Washington, the three of them were spending enormously, uh, basically to counter. Iran and and to counter Iran, uh, they and and also of course to you know push back on kind of any you know, you know climate climate agenda that might you know get in the way of where uh, their their fossil fuel interests lay, and and that often meant targeting kind of the the left flank of the Democratic Party, and so uh, Josh Gottheimer kind of became the the kind of lead. Uh, antagonist against particularly Rashida Tlaib uh, and, and Ilhan Omar, uh, pr you know, just repeatedly pushing for, you know, censure resolutions, uh, going on, you know, cable news re regularly to, to denounce his colleagues and encouraging other Democrats to then also denounce them, uh, teaming up with Hakeem Jeffries to, to do a kind of uh, a, a super PAC that was aimed at kind of going after them. Uh, and going and going after kind of squad aligned candidates as as well. So th that that's really the kind of nexus of this civil war that's going on inside the uh, House Democrats. We have about two minutes to go, Ryan, and I'm wondering if you can talk about what most shocked you in the research for your <laughs> book, The Squad. I think it was the the sheer amount of money uh, that was involved. And just how dominant it been, because we, we can say the numbers over and over again, 30 million, 40 million, 100 million dollars. But what doesn't quite come through is how that influences not just the races where money is spent, but also where it's not spent. And so I, I heard of so many different conversations that would be held among you know, consultants and campaigns that that were worried that APAC or DMFI was going to start spending millions of dollars in their race. And they would meet, they'd have a conference call, and they'd figure out, okay, 
how do we stave this off? And so this is without APAC even spending a dime. And they would say, well, let's, you know, the easiest thing we can do is let's just post, I stand with Israel. And some candidates would just do that. And then others uh, would reach out to DMFI. Uh, John Fetterman, uh, his campaign did this. Others did it as well. And say, what, what do we need to do? Like, what kind of policy positions do we need to publicly have so that you're going to stay out of this race? Not that you're going to fund us, but that you're not going to fund our opponents. And that really, it, to a shocking degree, constrained you know, what Democratic candidates were willing to say when it came to criticizing Israel. Ryan Grimm, we want to thank you so much for being with us, D.C. Bureau Chief for The Intercept. Um, Ryan's new book is called The Squad, AOC and the Hope of a Political Revolution. And we'll also link to your articles at The Intercept as you continue to cover this issue. For those who didn't get to see Democracy Now! on January 1st, um, you can go to democracynow.org and see the Belmarsh Tribunal, excerpts of it, uh, looking at the case of Julian Assange, whose final appeal goes um, before a London court on February 20th and 21st. Democracy Now! produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Teresena. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez for the first edition of Democracy Now! Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.